5 to 11 servings of bread, cereal, or rice. What? 3 to 5 of vegetables and 4 of fruits. Is pfft. Their antioxidants and fiber help you to digest. If I were to tell you that about 100 years ago, pretty much most of our deaths came from infectious diseases. Right? So about 100 years ago, most of our deaths in terms of population came from infectious diseases. And if you look at this scale here, this is a pie diagram of the deaths we have currently in terms of which are the most likely. It says heart disease is number one, cancer number two, stroke number three, chronic respiratory disease number four, accidents, diabetes, Alzheimer, and kidney disease. So from those top ten, eight of them are non-infectious. This is in the developed world, so in Australia or America. In this case, eight of them are non infectious and you've got pneumonia and flu and infection which accounts for about in total in, according to this chart about three percent be a bit higher or be different from country to country but three percent of our current death rate roughly in that category comes from infectious diseases whereas 100 years ago it was the majority so that's interesting and if you look at for example if you have a look at here this is a chart of the world's death from infectious disease. So these are different types of infectious disease. So 100 years ago, the main killer was smallpox. Smallpox killed a lot of people. And so did um, diseases like polio, that was also really crippling and, and killing. So these diseases were a massive problem about 100 years ago. And you have a look here, they're not actually even inside the chart anymore. So nowadays, we don't have a problem with smallpox anymore, even though 100 years ago, it was the main killer. So not only did we have a shift from people dying from infectious diseases in the developed world to people dying from non-infectious, it's a bit different in the developing world, but in the developed world, it's the non-infectious diseases carry the most risk. But also we have diseases which were used to be a massive killer have now more or less been completely eliminated in terms of a problem. And that's what this chart shows. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because why would that have hurt? Why would that have happened? Well, how could we have shifted so drastically from infectious and from these specific diseases like smallpox to a condition, a scenario now where these are basically not a problem anymore in the developed world? And the reason why is one of the reasons why, one of the main reasons why is because of vaccines. Not the only one, but one of the main reasons. And the dot point itself says outline the way in which vaccinations prevent, the, prevent infection. That's what we have to talk about in this video. And maybe this makes a bit more sense towards the end as well, as to why we have smallpox not being around anymore. Now, what are vaccinations? Well, vaccinations are quite interesting. If you inject a vaccine into someone, you're actually injecting a pathogen into them, in most cases. A pathogen. So you're actually putting a pathogen into someone, and that's called a vaccine. So, But what you actually do is you inject either a weakened or a dead pathogen into blood. So it's not actually going to infect you, it's not going to cause you any harm. So you do put a pathogen into someone, but that pathogen is either weak, so it's so weak that it can't cause disease, or it's dead. So why would we inject a dead pathogen or a weakened pathogen into someone's blood? But remember, what causes an immune response? It's not necessarily the pathogen themselves. This is the pathogen here. You can see I drew a sad face because the pathogen himself is, or herself I shouldn't be sexist, is dead. So in this case, we have this pathogen, which might be a virus, for example, and it has antigens. And the antigens are actually the thing that causes the immune response, not the virus directly. So even though this antigen, uh, sorry, this virus is dead, it still has these antigens sticking in. So if we put it into blood, and let's say we, for example, have a, this is a macrophage, we have this macrophage which comes and finds an antigen, it will still do it, what it usually does, eat pathogen, it's a phagocytosis, it's a macrophage that does phagocytosis, and then put that on its molecule, so it will take the antigen and put it on the molecule, and then move to the T helper cell. And that T helper cell will activate the immune response, and then you're going to have, all of a sudden you're going to have lots of bacteria. Yeah, so not, not, not bacteria, you're going to have lots of white blood cells, lymphocytes, and everything else coming about. Importantly, so if you do this, if you inject the pathogen into the blood, you're going to produce lymphocytes, you're going to produce T 
plus B lymphocytes because the T helper cell will make that happen, which means you're going to have you know, you're going to have your B lymphocytes producing antibodies and your T lymphocytes going and killing them for chemical means. And that's all well and good, but obviously, I mean, they're already dead, so it doesn't really matter. Why would you produce T and B lymphocytes if they're already dead? It's not going to make us any, it's not going to make any difference in the future. But importantly, remember I also said that another type of T cell and B cell also get produced, and this was the memory cells, so the T and the B memory cells. And it, we do all this to produce these memory cells, because the memory cells will give us immunity for a long time. Right? They will make sure that we won't get sick again. So you can imagine I'm going to just draw a memory cell, which has come about because of this infection. So we've got a memory cell now, which is going to stain our blood, and it's going to have be specific for that virus. So let's say this was the this was the uh, the flu virus. It's going to be specific, so it's going to find that same flu virus again. So whenever that comes in the future, if we were, if it were to come and infect us normal normally, what would happen is the memory cell would be inside our blood, and it would be able to detect the pathogen really quickly. That's the reason why we actually put vaccines into people is to give them uh, immunization to make them immune. The reason why is because whilst we have this immune response, we produce the T and the B lymphocytes, which help us kill. So the T killer cells and the B lymphocytes, they help us kill the actual pathogen. But we also produce this memory cell, and this memory cell is really useful when it comes to long-term immunity because it's going to make sure we don't get sick again straight after. Right. So there, this is here. This is a pretty sort of important table just for you to be able to understand why how these memory cells work. So here we've got concentration of antibodies, and here we've got time. So on the x-axis, we've got time. On the y-axis, we've got the concentration of antibodies. And remember, the actual antibodies are produced by the B cells. So I'm going to draw a quick B cell. And what the B cells will do is they will produce a plasma cell when they, when they are activated. And this plasma cell will be producing the antibodies. So basically, a measure of the amount of antibodies is a measure of how many B cells we have because they're going to be, or how active these B cells are, because they're going to be producing these antibodies. So what we have is we have two responses. We've got the primary response and the secondary response. Now the primary response was initially when we injected the pathogen into the blood, and then it got detected by the lymphocyte, uh, sorry, the, in this case the mac macrophage, and the macrophage brought it to the T helper cell. And then we have the immune response. That's the primary response. It's the first time we were exposed to the actual pathogen. It's called the primary response. So the first time we were exposed is called the, the primary response. And as you can see, the amount of antibodies that are produced are pretty I mean, low compared to what's going to happen next. And the time it takes is also. So it takes quite some time because you can imagine, you know, the T helper cells have to activate the T and B lymphocytes. Then the T and B lymphocytes have to go to the area, find the actual macrophage. They have to duplicate and everything else. So it will take some time for that prime response to happen. That's why when you're, for example, sick, often you're sick and you don't actually notice it. You only notice it a couple of days later because that's when your primary response has really kicked in and they're really finding the infection. So in this case, the first time you're sick, the first time you've been introduced this pathogen has been introduced, it's going to take some time. But the second time, and this is where your memory cells come into place, this is where your memory cells come into place. Second time, you can see here, in a really short period of time, we have a huge increase in antibodies. This is where the concentration of antibodies. So in a short period of time, a huge increase in, in antibodies. And then it will die down pretty quickly as well afterwards because the infection itself dies, so, dies off so quickly. You can imagine as soon as someone comes in, as soon as the pathogen which has this memory cell comes in, as soon as it happens, we're going to have a T memory cell detected. And because the T memory cell will actually give it a command, an even bigger command than, than beforehand, as soon as the memory cell is activated, it will tell the B cells to not just produce antibodies, but produce a lot of antibodies. So these T memory cells will help make sure the second response happens by producing, by making the B cells sending chemical messages to the B cells to produce a lot of antibodies, which means there's going to be a sharp rise in the antibodies as soon as we have a reintroduction of that same pathogen. 
and that means the actual pathogen will be killed really quickly, and you wouldn't even notice that you've been infected by the pathogen because it's killed before it can do anything. That's the idea with the, the second response. And basically with vaccinations, what we're trying to do is we're trying to artificially induce the primary response to make sure that in future we don't have to deal with the primary response anymore. When the next time when the bacteria comes into our body, we instantly go to the secondary response. Right? So for example, let's say if this were the measles virus, right? The measles virus, we'll give it we'll give inject a dead measles virus into children. And this will make the primary response happen. But the good thing is the, the actual kid won't be infected, it won't be sick because it's a dead virus. And if the measles virus comes back, then we're going to have, instead of having the primary response, if the actual measles virus comes back, if the one that we're just alive comes back, we're not going to have the primary response, we're going to have the secondary response. Which means as soon as that virus comes into our body, the memory cells will detect them and it will make sure that the actual virus gets killed. Now that's important because we, as soon as our kids are infected with measles, they would actually suffer a lot. And in many cases, they would die. That's why, and sorry, measles, um, smallpox, whatever, whatever it is, they're all quite, quite harsh. But as soon as that happens, you're basically in trouble. So by doing vaccinations, we make sure that the kid doesn't get infected in the first place because the primary response is artificial. It's not actually dangerous. And then when they come back, if the alive ones come back, the secondary response will make sure that it will, the, the host, so the child, won't get infected. There's two different types of vaccinations or immunizations. There's actively acquired. That means you either have gotten sick. So either you've gotten sick and that's why you, you become immune. So you've become immune because you've gotten sick and then your B cells are being produced. Or the past or another different type of actively acquired one is the vaccines. And this is obviously becoming more and more popular nowadays. Instead of making sure that we have to get sick and, and that's why we're immune, you just give someone a vaccine because some diseases you don't want to actually get sick by because they might kill you. So by giving them a vaccine instead, we're kind of tricking our body into making sure that you know, we've got this actively acquired immunity because we've got these T cells floating in our body. Right, so this is active acquired means that we've actually somehow been exposed to the actual pathogen and either for sickness or for the vaccine and thereby become immune. Now, passively acquired is a bit different. In this case, all we do is we take antibodies from someone else. So antibodies from someone else and inject them into our actual body. So for example, let's say you're going to a certain place that might have a disease that you're trying to be protected by. You might not be given a vaccine, you might be injected but with antibodies against that disease, which means you might be immune with that disease for maybe two weeks or maybe a bit more, whatever. But you'll be for a short time you'll be immune because you've got these antibodies in your blood and then once the antibodies have been destroyed which they do over time then you're not immune so passively acquired immunity is all about injecting antibodies into your blood and thereby you're immune until those antibodies go away again whereas actively acquired immunity is all about being exposed to a pathogen then triggering an immune response producing these memory cells and the memory cells will make sure that you don't get sick anymore in general now, there's a couple of things. So, for example, the flu virus, whilst there are flu vaccines, so you can get vaccines against the flu virus, one of the problems with the flu vaccines is the actual flu virus mutates so fast, it mutates a lot, which means that the one we have this year is going to be different to one we're going to have next year, which means a flu vaccine won't last your lifetime. It might last, if you're lucky, a year, and you have to get a different one next year because it might have a different type of receptor. So it might have this receptor one year, so your memory cells will detect that, Whereas next year, it's going to have changed, so now it's going to have this receptor. So the same memory cells won't be able to detect the flu virus anymore, right? So that's why flu is, is hard to get rid of. Whereas something like polio or me uh, or smallpox, they stay constant. So once we get a vaccine against smallpox, or we'll usually be immune for life in many cases. So that's the first thing you should know about vaccines. And also, you should know that we often have these... For example, let's say we have first injection after six months, then another one after 18 months, and then another one after a couple, maybe two or three years. That's often how it happens with vaccines. One early on, another one's are a couple a year later, and then another one maybe when you're younger. So usually we have vaccines when you're quite young. The reason why we have not just one but more is because these are booster. These are booster. They call booster vaccination injections. 
And that basically makes sure that our levels of the memory cells are so high that after the third time, we're going to basically be having them stay forever. In most cases, not in all cases, but some of them will actually stay forever. So if you only do it once, we might have an increase in B cells and B and T memory cells, but eventually a drop in, t in the cells again. But by having these booster injections, basically sort of training our body to make sure that it knows you need to keep these levels high because we could have that actual infection coming back anytime. So keep those levels high, please. And that's obviously good for us because that means we're going to be immune. I'll quickly go over the dot point again. Outline the ways in which vaccinations prevent infection. Vaccinations is all about injecting either a weakened or a dead pathogen into the blood. And by doing so, we make sure that we can actually trigger the immune response. But the good thing is they're dead, so they're not going to cause us infection. When they trigger the immune response, we're going to produce these T and B lymphocytes. For the T, killer cells and the B lymphocytes will help us kill the infection. But I mean, obviously, they're already dead, so it doesn't really matter. But also importantly, we produce these memory cells, both the T and the B memory, memory cells, which will stay in our blood for some time. And what that allows us to do, it allows us to jump to a secondary response whenever we have an infection, which we might not actually have been sick by beforehand, but because we've gotten a vaccine, we don't go to the primary response, we go to secondary response because of the vaccine. And that's really important because the secondary response means it's, it's such a huge increase in antibodies in such a, sh a short period of time that anything that comes will basically be killed really quickly. And that means if it's a smallpox virus that you've been vaccinated against, that means you're going to kill a smallpox virus before you become sick. And that's really good because the smallpox virus is really deadly, so you don't want to become sick with smallpox. Now, you also, if when you get, virus, when you get vaccinations, you basically need to get a vaccine for all the major problems. Right? You don't just get one vaccine for all viruses. You need to get one vaccine for this. Smallpox virus, for the measles virus, etc., etc. So yeah, because they're specific, you need to get a vaccine for each individual pathogen that you want to get vaccinated against. And then we talked about active and passive acquired immunity. Active is when you've actually been exposed to pathogen, either in a dead form, in the form of vaccines, or in the live form when you get sick and that causes you to be immune. Again, in most cases, we want to have a vaccine if they're, if they're trying to prevent deadly infections, because if we get the infection, we might not actually be able to survive the first time. And then there's passive acquired immunity, which is when we actually get antibodies, which are usually produced by B cells, but we get these antibodies pumped into our blood directly. That gives us immunity for a couple of weeks, but it will actually usually go away again. It's called passive because we're not actually infected by the pathogen. And that's what you should know for this dot point. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.